A capacitor is simply a device that is used to store an electric charge and as a result can store energy. Really, capacitors are found everywhere. Some are used to start your car, some can filter static out of a radio station, some power flashlights, some store energy in heart defibrillators. So the idea behind storing energy in a capacitor is incredibly useful. At its most basic, a capacitor is two conducting plates separated by some space or insulator. This is what we refer to as a parallel plate capacitor. We can then connect those plates to a battery. The positive terminal of the battery supplies positive charges to the plate it is connected to, and the negative terminal supplies an equal number of negative charges to the other plate. Since the capacitor has an equal number of positive and negative charges, its overall charge is neutral. We refer to it as storing a charge, Q, because there is now a uniform electric field being produced in between the plates. The electric field in the, between the plates serves as a way to store the energy. And as you might imagine, the more charge that a capacitor can hold, the more energy it can store. The amount of charge a capacitor can hold depends on the capacitor itself. The physical characteristics such as size and material ultimately decide the maximum charge that can be held by the capacitor. The charge also depends on the voltage applied from the battery in order to charge the capacitor. Capacitance is simply the amount of charge stored per volt. This gives us a label of coulombs per volt, or one farad. Now different capacitors will store a different amount of charge when the same voltage is applied, so this particular definition is somewhat misleading. If we just look at this equation, we would probably decide that if we apply more charge, then the capacitance will increase. Or if we increase the voltage, then the capacitance will increase. But depending on the makeup of our capacitor, the maximum capacitance really doesn't change. The capacitance of any given capacitor is pretty constant. So really a better way to describe what is happening is to write the expression in terms of charge being a function of the voltage applied to a specific capacitance or in terms of its voltage, since that's a lot of times what we're looking at anyway. If we look at two parallel plate capacitors, we can see a little better how the specific properties of each one contribute to the capacitance. Each set of plates is separated by a distance d. This distance is a space where the electric field will be produced. The plates have a certain surface area, a. In comparing the two figures, you could logically come to the conclusion that the surface area of the first set of plates is less than the surface area of the second set of plates. There are, of course, things that you could argue about that statement if you were so inclined, but for now, let's just say that the one on the left has more area than the one on the right. The charge density on the plates of a given capacitor is simply the number of charges in a given area. Say we charge each capacitor so that they have the same number of charges. Since the first capacitor has a smaller area than the second capacitor, the density of the charges will be higher. The size of the electric field inside a capacitor actually depends on this charge density and the permittivity of free space constant. This constant is basically a measure of how much the molecules in between the plates oppose the electric field. Since it is called the permittivity of free space, we are assuming there is only air in between the plates of our capacitors when we use it. Now we have defined the charge density as the amount of charge divided by the area of the plates. So we can substitute those values into the equation for the capacitor's electric field. But we also know that the electric potential in a uniform field is the strength of the electric field times the distance the charges move. This is actually pretty handy for us because electric potential is something we can measure very easily with a voltmeter. So the potential difference, ignoring negative signs for now, is a charge on the capacitor times the distance between the plates divided by the area of the plates and the permittivity of free space. Now going back to capacitance, which is the charge over the voltage, we can plug in the expression for voltage, and we get a wonderfully simple expression for the capacitance as the permittivity of free space times the area of the plates divided by the distance separating the plates. So really, if we want to increase the capacitance of a system, we would want to increase the area of the plates or decrease the distance between the plates. Starting out simply, what is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor with metal plates each of area 1 meter squared, separated by 1 millimeter. We know area and the distance between. The only tricky part here is to change the millimeters to meters, and we find a capacitance of 8.85 times 10 to the negative 9th farads. This is a really small capacitance. The plates are 1 meter in area, which is pretty large, and the distance between them is only 1 millimeter. Think for a second how you would build something that has that large of a plate and keep those plates only one millimeter apart. So then what charge is stored in this capacitor if the voltage of 3.0 times 10 to the third volts is applied? 
Capacitance is also the amount of charge divided by the voltage, so we can rearrange that equation to solve for the charge. Plugging in what we know and remembering that a farad is a coulomb per volt, we find 2.66 times 10 to the fifth coulombs, or 26.6 microcoulombs. Remember a while back when we found the amount of charge in a static discharge? It really wasn't much larger than this. So this particular capacitor can't hold much in the way of charge.